to continually draw us by the Holy Ghost. He'll give us great moments of encounters with Him that we might be hungry and thirsty for more. But it always comes down to the individual person's response as to how much of this wonderful glory of God is going to be realized in the line. There's a lot of things in this here and this now that will try to affix itself to you. Things that would try to attach themselves to your affections and to your heart. That really all they are is substitutes for God. I said that right. Substitutes for God or otherwise we define that as an idol. Substitutes for God. There are things that fill you up with a sense of security and safety and self-worth. Give you value, give you meaning, give you purpose, give you vision. But they're not anything belonging to that purpose and that vision and that value which has been given to us in Christ Jesus, the real meaningful one. Every one of us are constantly making choices. Should you choose today that you only want the Lord, you're going to serve Him with all your heart, you're just going to get, go ahead and begin to participate with all the things that the Word of God describes and be all that God has purposed us to be and given us the power to be, then things will begin to radically change in your individual life and then you will have an impact upon the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in a collective manner. Hallelujah. And what we'll do today is we'll spend this day this morning and we'll spend this evening and we will present to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ by presenting to you the presence of Jesus Christ, ministering to you by the Holy Spirit. And today I'm believing God that in His mercy and His grace, He will so overwhelm you that it will be impossible for you to even resist in any way or there will be impossible for any power of darkness to hinder you from the glory that He would desire to reveal to you so that you might see how good and wonderful He really is, how awesome it is to dwell with Him and live in His presence and turn away from all those things that have kept you from all that He's purposed for you to do. Those, those things that you've defined value and derived meaning from in the world are just distractions from all that Papa has for you. Amen. 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 You can be seated. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I'm so blessed by the ministry of the Spirit that people will inherit. You get to be what you are in God because God the Holy Spirit chooses to give you something that you don't have from a natural birth. And um, it's wonderful when all God's people not only receive an inheritance of grace, but mature in it and grow in it to where that it that gifting expresses more of the manifest glory and power of God, whether it's healing or miracles, whether it's prophecy, word of knowledge. There's something wonderful about the anointing of that person, those who know how to flow in the realms of worship and praise. And God wants you to understand that. We want you to understand that when we begin to worship and praise, it's not some preliminary thing to the meaning. meeting. It's the opportunity for you to begin to step into the atmosphere of prophecy, to the atmosphere of that which the Lord poured out upon His church. Hallelujah. We just had a wonderful night, uh, time here last night. I mean, you know, when you just captivated in the presence of the Lord, hours become seconds. And... Um, you know, we're so blessed to have Joshua here. Amen. Every one of you who want to do music, you want to plug into what he's doing. Because if you think it's human, and if you think it's about talent, nothing to do with it. It's not human, not talent. You get talent on a softball field. Get talent on a football field. Get talent at skiing. Get talent at swimming. Get talent at this, talent at that. Nothing to do with it. It's stepping into a realm of the anointing something that only God gives. And the Holy Ghost decides who's going to get it. 
And that's why he says covet to prophesy. He says you've got to desire these things more than anything else. And when you desire it and you serve it and you love it and you want to have it, you get to have, you get to receive. It's really, you know, the thing about it is I talked about on the School of the Spirit on Friday night. I ministered on the reality of the introduction to the Lord and, and then how that introduction to the Lord Jesus Christ that had been brought to us by the grace and the mercy of God brings us to a place of hunger because once we have an encounter with God, we want more, usually. Now, I know that things will come along. Satan will discourage, distract, you'll be led away. You, you receive, you know, you, all kinds of things that Satan can try to do, create a spirit of offense, just on and on. The list goes on. But usually when people have an encounter with the Lord, they're going to hunger for more. And then out of that hunger for more, ultimately the Lord teaches us how to receive more. He teaches us really how to yield. Because right now, the glory of His presence, son, just turn up just a little bit. The glory of His presence. Hallelujah. Praise God. It saturates the earth right now. But when we're distracted by all these other things, we, aren't able to, we are not able to receive that which is available, that which is happening. Prophecy, prophecy is an ongoing, continual thing. The Lord gives us the first expression of a baptismal anointing. That means a gifting without measure. Hallelujah. Unlimited. When He gives to us this wonderful baptism in the Holy Ghost with this realm of the expression of other languages, the languages of the Spirit. Hallelujah. But then in the prophecy is the same way. Miracles, gifts of healing. Somebody said, well, if it's the same way, why don't we see it? Because there's not a lot of people who've really stepped into that realm. They've not been willing to go all the way with God. Does that stop God from interacting with people? No, because he's so merciful. He's so merciful. I hear people say he's Lord of all or not Lord at all. My goodness, if that was true, you know what? There would be very people even saved. It's just true. Because God, there's very few people who make Jesus Christ Lord of all. It's just very true. It's very true. Very few people. But God in His love and His mercy still reaches out, draws us with His loving kindness, shows us His grace, shows His goodness. And if we'll continue to respond, what we're going to find out, what we're going to discover is this, that there is far more to this relationship than we ever realized. My wife and I, the other day, we were watching Catherine Coleman. You know, when I was a little guy, I used to think, oh my goodness, Catherine Coleman's so weird. She's so strange. She almost scared me, you know. <laughs> and... Um, Still, you know, when she does her thing, you know, it's, it's still strange. But now I know what's going on. I didn't know then. I was, in a, I was in a revivalist home. I lived in church all the time. I, you know, but I didn't really know that realm. And I were watching. I said, baby, isn't it wonderful to know what she's feeling? And it's so sad that very few people know what she's feeling. They've known, they know the feeling of being high on everybody else thinking that they're so wonderful or good or done something great because the applauses have been, the hand claps so great, you scored a goal, you sang a good song, you did a good work, whatever. They've been high on alcohol and drugs and high on other things and success. But very few people have known the beauty and the splendor of being raptured in His presence by His divine power and grace. Nobody can create that or make that happen for themselves. God gives it. I want you to listen very carefully. Listen, try to listen. Look, I could, I could be hysterically laughing right now too. I want you to try to listen. I could be prophesying right now. I could be giving it. I just could be the whole time. But I'm interested in ministering the word. You, you, there's plenty of time for you to be able to do that. You listen to me. Hallelujah. There's plenty of time. I could do that. You can do that 24 hours a day. You can laugh and rejoice in God and prophesy to you, you know, hallelujah. If you know how to prophesy and rejoice in your closet, I guarantee you, you know how to prophesy and rejoice in the right kind of way outside. True. Uh, I, don't mind, I don't mind divine interruptions. I don't mind them. I especially like to see devils go out of people who are possessed by them, those who are oppressed, delivered, those who are blinded by the powers of darkness set free. Those who are sick and diseased, healed, and made whole. Amen. Amen. And of course, I want to see all God's people get blessed by just, you know, bottom line of it is I want you to just see you. I want to see you captivated by the things that God's calling out to you to do right now. He's, 
Believe it or not, the Lord demands change. <laughs> Some people think that he's just going to accept you like you are. No, he's not going to accept you like you are. He's going to call you like you are. He's going to invite you to come like you are and provide you the change to be just like him. Because he's a lot better than the devil. Are you listening to me? And when you were born, you were born in sin and were more like the devil than you like God. Now, that's hard for people to understand. But just the way it is. And then people think that there's something really special about the human condition. And nothing special about the human condition. It's messed up. And God in His loving kindness and tender mercy made a way of escape for you and I to be able to stand in the presence of the Lord and know what life is all about. I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. And I want to talk to you about the Lord making a way back in. I want to tell you the Lord made a way back in. Say the Lord made a way back in. The Lord made a way back in. The Lord made a way back in. Now, you may understand that and need to understand that various different degrees. But when you begin to understand it in a way that only the Holy Ghost can cause you to realize, then you begin to pursue that which heaven has made available and it becomes your single interest. It becomes your single desire. When... Um, when David was under the threat of losing out in relationship with God. And I could think about when Nathan came to David. And Nathan is beginning to tell David, you are the man. The transgressor, the sinner. He describes the story to David to make a point. And it was about his sin that he had with Bathsheba. About the blood, the innocent blood that he had killed and shed when he killed Uriah, her husband. Up until that time, David had never shed innocent blood. He had no blood upon his hands. He had only obeyed. He had no guilt blood upon his hands. Everything he did, he had obeyed God. This is now going to be the guilt blood. It would keep him from being able to build the house. And he could recall Nathan standing there and he's giving, Nathan's laying down the judgment to the prophet, to the priest, and to the king. Because the prophet and the priest and the king can't hear no more. He's deceived himself. He thinks back to Saul and how Saul had lost out on the anointing. And how Saul had become demon-possessed and the only way that he could even have any joy or any happiness was to get around someone anointed. To get around somebody who carried the presence of the living God because that's the only place life is. Otherwise, you're living in death. Grief is a form of death. Sorrow is a form of death. Pain is a form of death. Hurt is a form of death. Heartache, form of death. Men live in death. They think it's normal. They think this is what everybody has, to, how everybody has to live. And they try to mitigate it with all the various different types of opiates, drugs that you can imagine. The drug of success, the drug of money, the drug of drugs, the, the drug of relationships. Like the woman who had five husbands and now was married to a man who wasn't her husband, always trying to feel the, the loneliness, the hurt, the sorrow, the death was some form of life. And the only way you can begin to get at that life is by some degree focusing in on some kind of love, or some kind of joy, or some kind of peace. But art come by. Little flashes, little flashes in the pan, as it were. But it's not real. It doesn't last. It's just an illusion. Because Satan can't give it. Satan can't give it. He can't give it. Only God can give it. It only belongs to God. It's, Satan can't give it because it doesn't belong in his realm. It only belongs to God because it, it belongs in his realm. He has life. He is the life realm. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Father God, that in your mercy and your loving kindness that everybody would be able to hear. David goes, oh, take not your presence from me, Lord. Saul, because he's the one who came with the heart and with the anointing to worship so that Saul could have some peace from the affliction of the death that he lived in. 
He could look and see that he could look and see that torment on Saul's face. He cries out, Take not your presence from me, O Lord. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. He gets down on his face and he begins to cry out before the presence of the Lord at the feet of Nathan who brought the word of the Lord. That's all it takes with the Lord. Some people would get a spirit of offense. Saul got the spirit of offense. Saul didn't cry out. He became offended. Who do you think you are? Talking to me like this. Huh? Prophet, you can't tell me. But there's others who are so set upon the Lord, they know the voice of the Lord no matter who it comes from. Huh? Saul didn't cry out. He became more rebellious and more arrogant. But oh, when we cry out, gone. Your presence is all that I desire. You know, I, I can't go back over the message that I gave in the School of the Spirit on Friday night, but it really burns in my heart because I really want people to understand this, this journey, this call of God, these opportunities, these unrealized opportunities and these missed opportunities that so many people ultimately experience because they don't make the right decision. If you make the decision of what the Word of God says, you'll make the right decision every time and you'll stay on the way. Hallelujah. You just continue to cry out for God. He's there for you. He wants to give to you all that he belongs to himself. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, we read a verse of scripture here that is pretty radical. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. We recognize and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in, in the spirit of the day or as it says in King James in the cool of the day he was actually walking in the spirit of the day the value of the day the meaning of the day the purpose of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. This is a sorrowful thing that continually goes on and people don't realize it because it's not as overt. But when there's sin, when there is a guilty conscience, when there's things going on in people's lives that are not right with the Lord, what happens as soon as the presence of the Lord begins to move, they run away, they hide, they retreat and stay in the same room many times. They hide and they retreat at the calling of God and go to do those things that they found meaning in and value in because there's too much conflict over here. There's too much, there's too much change that God's demanding. There's, it is too challenging for them to make decisions that's going to redefine their life or that, that is going to demand of them to give something up or to do something differently. They retreat from the presence of the Lord. I pray today that after this day, after this wonderful, glorious day, that you'll never retreat from the presence of the Lord ever again, but you'll pursue and you'll cry out, take not thy presence from me. Lord, more, Father, more of that glory. See, David didn't even have the opportunity that you and I have. He didn't have the access that you and I have. He did not have an unlimited, unrestricted access into the glory of the presence of the Lord where you and I ultimately will go beyond that experience that Moses had whose face shone with the brightness and the glory of God because of his encounter. Many people's faces gloomed over with death. They don't know it. They, they put the makeup on or do whatever, you know, they need to do. Put the smile on, but their face is glossed over with death. It's not very pretty. God wants the brightness of your countenance. God wants the, the beauty of, your, of, of the expression of your face to shine with heaven. Hallelujah. He does. Only the Holy Ghost can give you that. What do you want? You want makeup? You want make believe? Or do you want the bare reality of his presence? Hallelujah. You know, when you look over in the end of the chapter, we can see, and the scripture says 
that the Lord, in verse 23, sent them forth from his garden. He drove them away so that they might till the ground. There was no tilling of the ground in the garden. There was no need to. All provision was brought to man by the Father. He needed to do nothing. All he, was, all he had needed was provided for him. He lived in a place of this glory and this splendor of this divine grace and power, this realm of faith that we can't even hardly begin to even speak of right now. He had a place in a relationship with Father and unlimited access where Almighty God came in the fullness of His glory. As one man said, it came in the nakedness of His beauty or the beauty of His nakedness to a naked man He created in total innocence. Can't even begin to comprehend all of that. It's, it's defiled within the mind of men to even consider. It's defiled already to even start with. So, you know... Of course, the Lord doesn't say that, so we, we, don't, we don't know that that is truly the case, but we do know that God came in the naked reality of His glory, un, 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 uninhibited and unlimited, and man stood there in the purity of that innocence of, of how God created him, being able in human form, in flesh and blood form, to behold all of that and live. Huh? Now the Lord drove him from the garden said, now you till the ground. Now you're going to labor. So he drove him out and placed at the east of the garden a cherubim with a flaming sword which turns every way. Cherubim literally means the one who protects the presence of God. He will not allow anything that defiles He's a protector. He's not allowing any kind of unholiness, any ungodliness. In fact, this is just impossible. You, you and I get to step into the presence of the Lord with the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we walk into the presence of the Lord, there is no sense of sin. If there's only holiness, no unholiness is even allowed in, period. It just can't even come in. It's only by the blood of Jesus, a mercy and act of God's grace that has allowed us to experience whatever manifest presence that we've experienced up to this point right now today. God's people could actually live continually in, a manif in the manifest presence of God, but unfortunately, many only have the manifest presence of the living God occasionally at revival times, at special special meetings and special occurrences and then it just may almost categorize as something special that every once in a while they can have and so they don't even earnestly seek to live in this glory that God has baptized us with. That that event, that that encounter was supposed to make you hungry for more of the manifest presence to the point that now God the Holy Ghost through that hunger can teach you how to yield so that you can live here in a full restoration. A relationship. Hunger isn't that difficult. It's really all an expression of love. That's all. I love you so much I want to be with you. Wow, that was amazing. Feeling your love and knowing quantifiably that you are here, that you exist. That you have, that all that you describe in the word, in your word, is a reality and meaningful to me. That is, it, it, it is applicable to me. It's, it's, it's what you want of me. So out of that, out of that, that we, out of that love, out of that, that encounter, I want more. <laughs> you know, Moses saying, I want more. And God says, you can't have the more that you want. I, I want more. I, I want to see you in all your glory. You can't. You'll die. And it's like Moses said, I don't care if I die. I just want more. Of, I want more of you. Lord, I want more. See, it's not any harder than that. Because in that, in that, there's going to be a dynamic going on where God's going to say, no, you can't have that if you want more of me. You can't have that other thing if you want more of me. No, you can't have that in your life if you want more of me. Hallelujah. God does not accept you as you are. He calls you as you are to change you to be like Him. He created the miracle through the new birth. 
that God in His mercy takes us as newborn babes and He fashions us and He teaches us the way of life. In your presence, you have taught us the paths of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, Psalm 1611. That's what David was referring to in, in Psalms 5111 when he said, Take not your presence from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with your liberating spirit. Hallelujah. You're liberating. Hallelujah that liberates me from all the stuff that would hold on to me and separate me from what you have. Now, we know that when the Lord drove out Adam and Eve from the garden, He didn't completely drive them out of His presence. Because we know that Abel was able then to come, empowered to come, and offer a sacrifice unto the Lord for which the Lord then responded with his presence with fire and consumed his offering that he offered upon the altar. And we also know here that because of what happened in terms of Cain's offense, because Cain didn't feel like he got his just deserves, because he, you know, he wanted to, he, he got into that thing that so many people get into, that criticism. He got into that thing that, you know, what's wrong with me? Who does he think he is? And why does God give him special treatment? Really, that's what it all comes down to. God didn't give him special treatment. He just did what was right. And then he told Cain, you do what was right and I'm going to give you the same exact results. People looking around saying, oh, I don't believe what's going on. People being critical of others who've got a greater anointing than them. And all the enemy does, the, the enemy is constantly mocking the anointing, criticizing the anointing, wanting to kill the anointing. And when you become sensitive to the Lord, sensitive to the presence of the Holy Ghost, you become very aware of Satan's lies. And you can then very, very quickly with great power and authority and determination shut those things down but unfortunately many people are subjugated to that realm they do not even know they think it's their own thoughts their own conclusions if they try to rationalize those thoughts and conclusions they would not be able to because it's simply the voice of Satan that has swayed men's thoughts turned men's thoughts but men still doing the same thing Cain still persecuting Abel why because of the anointing because of the manifest presence of God Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody said, well, John, 1 John 3 said because of his righteousness. Yeah, manifest presence of God, the anointing, the, the interaction, the relationship. Amen. Because that's where righteousness comes from anyways. Otherwise, it's just nothing but self-righteousness. I'm talking about God-righteousness. The righteousness that comes as a direct result of having his manifest presence in your life. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And then verse 16. Scripture says, and Cain went out of the presence of the Lord. Now here's the first, we got, we got Adam hid from the presence of the Lord. Adam and Eve hid from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord came, sought them out. He made provision for them. He, they were naked. He made a provision. It was like a covenant that he made. He made a provision. They tried to make provision for themselves, but they were still naked. Even out, You see, they made fig leaves, showed them, showed them together, and it covered things up. But they knew they were still naked. They were still undone. So God made a provision for them and offered, as it were, the first sacrifice that was ever offered. Father made the first sacrifice himself because he made coats of skin for them. And you can't make a coat of skin for somebody unless you do something. You kill something. Are you with me? You understand what I'm saying to you? I want, you, I want everybody to listen to me here today. I want you to just receive the word of God and realize that Father's made a provision for you through Christ Jesus so that you might be able to stay here in this wonderful realm of his presence. You may not, you, you know, you may not have stepped into all the fullness that he has available for you. And I've been, I don't even, I don't even know. Really, is there anybody on the planet today who's taken full advantage of all the fullness of God and that he's made, made, made ready, made available? And I think that just really comes down to hunger. And that hunger comes down to results in yieldedness. And that yieldedness results in a continual manifest presence of God. 
I just recently in my life stepped into a realm of knowing God where I continually live in the manifest presence. And I, I can look back and I can see the I can see the encounters. I can see the hunger that the encounters created. I can see that the, the ultimately the continual encounter that created a greater yieldedness. But yet, I mean, to live in the fullness of God's presence, I mean, my, the fullness of everything he has, I'm desperate for. I'm just that much more hungry. I mean, I, these works, I haven't even done these works yet. Because I've never raised anyone from the dead that I know of. And I would know it, I'm sure. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know. <laughs> I mean, somebody said, well, there is somebody in the meeting that, you know, well, I don't know about, I mean, goodness. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about these works. Now and then he says, I'm going to take you to great works. I'm hungry. And I'm not hungry for the works. I'm just hungry for the relationship, the fullness, the manifest presence brings all of the works. It's not the works brings the manifest presence. It's the manifest presence brings the works. It's the fullness. It's the glory. It's the relationship of love that exists there in that realm that results in everybody being impacted one way or the other. You're going to get sad, mad, or glad with me. I mean, it's like every revivalist said, it's going to be a revolt, a revival. You no know, one can be in the middle. People are going to hate you or love you if you do what God tells you to do. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I, you know, and then that's sad. Nobody wants anybody hating them. But I'm going to tell you right now, the love of the Father, His beauty, His splendor is more important to me than anything else. Hallelujah. I can give you examples of things that the Lord did in my life and, you know, that are so special to me and so meaningful to me. I'm not going to spend the time here or this morning. I want to encourage you that you can have those things in God and they become very special to you and very meaningful to you. And if you respond to them right, they will create a great hunger of desperation so that you can have another one and then another one and then another one and then another one and then another one. And then all of a sudden the frequency and the duration between each event becomes shorter, closer and closer together until you live in a continual manifest presence of His divine glory. And then a whole new de development, a whole new realm of hunger, a whole new realm of maturity begins because it's just more and more and more and increase and increase and you increase with the increase of God. What a, what, a, what a wonderful life. This is what Papa has for us. He's made, he made provision. So now Cain is cast out of the presence of the Lord and literally is sent to a place called exile. It's translated by some nod, but it literally means exile to be imprisoned, it's hell. Hell is an exile from God. It's the place, absence of all His presence. And when we read in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, I believe it is verse 8 and verse 9, we understand that the people who rebel against God, who, who, who fall after the, the power of the Antichrist spirit that is even present right now against the anointing, against the glory and the sovereign rulership of God, that they will be destroyed from the presence of God and the power of His glory. That's hell. Exiled. Today, men live. Even unrighteous men live in some measure of the presence of the Lord. He causes the rain. He, he's the only rainmaker. He causes the rain to fall upon the righteous and the unrighteous. His sun shines upon both the just and the wicked. If you listen to my daily bread, Malachi 7 2 the other day, forgive me, Micah. Micah. We'll get it right here. It's Micah. You, English, Micah, Hebrew, Micah. 7, chapter 7, verse 2. The faith of men are no longer in existence anymore. Mika says, every man hunts his brother with a net. People think things going to get a whole lot worse. Because Micah was looking at what's going to happen in the future. The day where all the rivers dry up and there's no more streams. When the sea has no more water. Where every man's hand is turned against his brother because of their defiance against God. And, and people want to get comfortable in that kind of a world? People, I'm telling you right now, 
Satan's governorship is ruthless. Why would you, having an opportunity to come into the fullness and presence of the Lord, ultimately run the risk of being completely set into exile? Separated from the presence of God because that day will come very soon and no one knows the day or the hour that you are going to depart from this life and give up the ghost and stand before Jesus Christ, the judge of all mankind. And he, and he will determine whether or not you come in, whether or not you've lived according to the divine nature, not the law of Moses, according to the new birth, not the, not the, not the acts of, of what men call good deeds. Whether or not you've lived as one who walks by the Spirit and lives in the Spirit, whether or not you have the Holy Ghost testifying to you, yes, you are a child of God. I've got the Holy Ghost testifying to me, I am a child of God. He testifies with groanings and with longings that cannot be uttered. He testifies with a great conviction upon my life that if I do anything outside of God's will, I am being immediately pulled and drawn into His presence. Satan would try to shut that down in so many different ways. And he comes like an angel of light to try to shut it down. To try to stop Holy Ghost conviction. To try to stop the voice of God calling us back to do that which is right and holy in the sight of the living God. You know, this cherubim angel that was set there in the garden who had a flaming sword to keep man from coming back in. When the Lord then had Moses build a tabernacle in which he would dwell in the wilderness, he made a place that would represent God's holy habitation, where the realm that God himself lives in, that the heavens of heavens cannot contain. But it represented a realm secluded from all men, First of all, clearly secluded from all the rest of the world. Secluded from the courtyard that surrounded. Secluded, rather, from the people that he had brought into covenant relationship with him. Secluded from the courtyard uh, 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 that where the people could gather. Secluded from the holy place where the Levites were allowed to minister. The priest that he had anointed. Secluded from everything. It represented that realm of the garden, that place of paradise, that place, another synonym for it is heaven, that place of heaven. Men lived in a place called heaven. When we say Garden of Eden, we're talking about the paradise of Eden. It's a synonym of, of, of heaven. It's a synonym for the realm of the unlimited access and, and place of God is dwelling. God himself dwells there. And there are in that holy of holies, that place secluded from all other places on the planet, all other realms of men, nothing common, nothing ordinary. Only someone anointed, especially by God, could come there. When he came there, upon the veil that separated the holy place from the holies of holies, there was the cherubim with his flaming sword. There was the cherubim. And then if you got inside, if you're one man anointed of God with a special grace and ability to come and step inside that sanctified place because Aaron was no more born again than anybody else, but he was given a special grace by God's divine mercy so that he could come and stand in that place that represented a realm that you and I right now literally have access to. And if you understand it, you'll want to be there more than you want to be anywhere. And when that happens, you can have it. And the church has got to hear. Otherwise, there'll never be a move of God as there was in the days of old. And I know it's going to happen because God says there's going to be a great glory yet to come. A great harvest, a great moving of the Spirit. Where that God, I understand what happened to the Soviet Union. I know that the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, used to be the evangelist of the world. They used to take missions all over the world. They were the champions of Jesus Christ before the Bolshevik Revolution. We know what happened with them. They fell away as a nation. It doesn't necessarily mean that America is going to champion God's cause because he's got a lot of other nations right now that are being stirred in Asia. 
God, God can change Syria overnight in Syria. My goodness, could be the champion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Israel could be. And we know they will be during the tribulation. All the evangelists will come out of Israel. Because their eyes will be open. They'll be taken off of them. <laughs> I will not be around to see it should I live in that time because I'll be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. They don't need me here. Huh? Virtue of Jews, full of God. It's like a, you know what I'm saying? It's like 144,000 Pauls will be raised up overnight. Can you imagine that? And about the middle of the time, Elijah and Enoch's going to take up from where they left off. Because they're going to get, they're gonna get catch, catch, caught, caught away. And then Elijah and Enoch, they're going to come. <laughs> they can continue to prophesy. If you could just hear the sermon that Enoch preached. He's coming with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all the ungodly. Are you ungodly? Do you have ungodliness going on in your life? Is there places of ungodliness going on in your life? Christ Jesus is going to come execute their judgments of God against all the ungodly for their ungodly deeds which they've ungodly committed. You have to ask yourself, are you going to run the risk of being ungodly because you somehow have bought into a lie that somebody else preached that you could be ungodly and be right? God said you can be ungodly and be right. You're going to be exiled. You'll be cast out of His presence. And it's a choice. It's not, God. it's not God's choice. It's man's choice. God's choice is that all men be saved. God's, God's choice was manifested in Christ Jesus when Jesus paid it all at Calvary's cross that people just yawn about. He paid it all. My goodness, that's the most important thing to me. That is the most sacred thing. That demands the greatest respect. That demands, demands the greatest honor. That demands the greatest reverence of anything that we could possibly imagine that God would be manifested in flesh and crucified at Calvary. Calvary's cross. How can anybody smirk at that? How can anybody just take that as ordinary and not be touched in the depths of their being by that? I do not understand lest they lost. For if our gospel will be hid, it's hid from those who are lost. That means they're not in the presence of the Lord. They're lost. They're wandering around in exile. They're lost. They're nomads. They're wanderers. And that's why Cain became a wanderer. Lost. God in His love, His desperate love for you and me, took upon the garments of flesh so that He could offer Himself in our stead to pay our penalty for sin in full, to erase every claim of Satan so that we would have an access back in. When his body was torn at Calvary's cross, the veil that separated all mankind from the presence of God was rent. And Paul and Matthew all likened, everybody who reads the gospel likened the wounds that Jesus Christ received in his body to that veil that separated man from God. That, that authority of a cherub angel that stood there saying you cannot come back in. Certain death, if you, you can't get past the cherub. This would be impossible. People fall out just from the manifest anointing that's in a person's life who hasn't stepped into all the fullness of God yet. Huh? I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to fall out seriously bad when you're in front of a cherubim. And then you're going to be incapacitated. Somebody say, oh, you get burned up. You won't even get that far. You won't even get that close. You're just knocked out. I heard one man at God say, he said, the Lord gave me anointing, and all I need to do is get within 20 people, 15 to 20 foot of people many times, and the same anointing will touch them. They'll feel it. And then, you know, describing how that most of the time, if he's just within people within four to six feet, they'll feel the anointing of, of the glory and the presence of God. Well, I, that's wonderful, and I, I understand that. And the reality of that, this is, is I, I want to see 
uh, the event take place in the people of God's life to where that isn't just happening in the, in the context of we're all ultimately in church service because people step into a greater yieldedness and there's a greater anointing and because of the greater yieldedness there's a greater manifest presence and then these things begin to happen. I want to see it happen once again like it did in the days of old where you're just in a store and you're just reaching for the cornflakes. Huh? And your hair's all messed up, you know, and you're in your warm-ups and you're reaching for the cornflakes and people falling out under the power of God because you lifted your hand. Huh? <laughs> Hallelujah. Because that's what happened in the days of old. That's what is available right now. There's no question about the manifest presence of His divine glory and what Father wants to do in signs and wonders and miracles to captivate the hearts of people. I mean, God has given to us the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I see what happened when Gabriel came in and said hello to Daniel. Bam! <laughs> he went out and completely knocked out and his was one dead. <laughs> My! Jesus has been exalted above all angels. He's been exalted above all principalities and powers. And you and I have been placed by the wonderful grace of God right in that place with Him. Well, you watch what happens. Papa's going to do it. I don't know. I'm, you know what? I, I used to have to try to get in. I used to do this. I was so anxious and earnest about people understanding this. I just argue with people. Because you know what? God knows what you're thinking right now. And he allows me many times, minister, to know what people are thinking well, as well. And then it becomes, you know, you know somebody, what somebody's thinking. And they're opposing what's going on. And they're not submitting what's going on. Well, what you want to do... What you can easily have a propensity to do is grab a hold of them and say, are you out of your mind? And try to wrestle with them and argue. And then everybody hears, you know, basically one side of the argument because the other person is silently talking, you know, and, and, and then the man of God's verbally talking. And then the other, other folks that are hungry are sitting around going, well, well, what's going on now? Well, we're trying to wrestle everybody to the ground. And the fact of it is, is that there's nothing necessarily wrong with that because at times that, that needs to be done. I mean, Father wrestled Jacob to the ground. Are you with me? Hallelujah. But Jacob was wanting to be wrestled. Hallelujah. He wanted to be wrestled. He wanted to be taken over. I say, I say, God, come rule over me. I say, God, come take your power and rule over me. I say, oh, God, come take your rod of iron and rule over me. Oh, God, come take complete control. Oh, Lord, I want you to have absolute authority with every thought, every action, every deed, everything that's going down in my life. Oh, God, I want to come under your Holy Ghost conviction and your Holy Ghost leadership that there's not one moment of my life being absence of your manifest presence. Hallelujah. And then I'll tell you right now, Father, we're going to answer that prayer. Father's going to answer that prayer. Where are you living at right now with the Lord? Are you just living in a covenant of grace that allows you the privilege of hearing the call of God and responding to basic kinds of commitments of coming to church on Sundays? Or where is it are you that you're living in relationship with God? Are you really living in the holies of holies? Are you there now living in a place of his continual manifest presence? Are you just happy to think that when you die you'll go to heaven and so you're just hanging on to a thin fabric of what you believe to underst and understand to be grace? Is that all you want? Just so that you okay? That you all right? So that you're going to make it? So that you got whatever protection you feel you need? Or have you been captivated by who he is? Have you been captivated by his life? Is his presence all that means something to you? Huh? I've watched men, because of their interest in science, make that their whole life. And they consumed with it and pursued it. And every day of their life, and now they're old men, they have spent over a microscope, over a test tube, over an instrument to try to figure out some little teeny tiny aspect of life. <laughs> How a couple of molecules interact with each other. Some little teeny tiny aspect of life. When Father says, come on in, I'm going to show you everything. I'm going to show you all that I did when I created the heavens and the earth. 
I'm going to fill you with so much of my love. It's more than you can contain. I'm going to fill you with so much of my joy and so much of my grace and so much of my life that all I can tell you is that it's abundant life. I'm going to fill you up with every good thing and wonderful thing. I'm going to show you who I am. Knowing Father is heaven. People say, what is heaven? Knowing Jesus. And no one knows the Father except for Jesus. And Jesus is amazing all by himself. And yet Father is greater than Jesus. Jesus said, Father is greater than I am. Just imagine knowing Papa. Just imagine knowing. What else you want? You determine where is it that you're going to live because God's made an access back in to heaven. He's made an access back into his presence. There's no more cherubim standing there keeping you out. It's not limited to just a few. Now the grace of God has been extended to all mankind. And he says, peace to those who are near and peace to those that are far off. He's saying to all mankind, come behold. Come see. Come learn of me, Jesus said. Come learn of me. The Holy Spirit's here to teach us. He's here to lead us in the way everlasting. He's here to fill us with that which will cause us to shout for joy. To cause our faces to shine with his peace. To shine with his glory. He's here to fill us with those things that man cannot even begin to imagine. They seek after them all day long through means that can never satisfy, that can never provide for them what they want. And God's made it freely, made it available freely to whosoever desires it. Christ Jesus is the door. He's the way. He says, come follow me. He says, this way into this glory is very narrow. There's only one passage through. There's only one way in. There's only one way in. It's almost got to duck down and squeeze through. It's like a tight place. It's very narrow. But he says, come. He describes it as narrow to help us understand that we can't bring other stuff with us. We can't bring other ideas with us. We can't bring our own desires with us. We can't bring our own interest with us. We can't bring our own selfishness with us. We've got to be willing to deny the self, forsake all these other things, and say, Lord, I just want to know you. So somebody said, does that mean we need to quit work and go live as a monastic in a cave. No. That means you need to quit all the other desires and appetites and affections that you have. Huh? And try to get out of work. People are trying to get out of work all the time. <laughs> get to work. And nothing to do with quitting work. Because you're going to have the same issues of affections and appetites and desires once you quit work. As you do when you were at work. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. What is it that you want right now? What is it that makes you happy, makes you sad? That will define where your affections are. If you're, all your affections are in Him, nothing in this life can make you sad. You rejoice in all your tribulations. You count it all joy. You'll know that Father's preparing you to every good work. He's fashioning you and forming you to be able to receive more, to have more. What is it that you want? God's made a way back in for you and me. Through the veil of the body of Christ Jesus. He's the door. We access, his, we access this door simply by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity and truth, God the Holy Ghost begins to move. Because he's the one who comes to manifest the word. And when God the Holy Ghost begins to move, the manifest presence of Jesus Christ is realized. Things begin to change. Things begin to happen. That you would never be able to change for yourself or make happen 
for yourself. You cannot make yourself hungry. Only God can. And you're hungry because He looked at your heart and saw that your heart was true and right before Him and gave you hunger. Hallelujah. You can't teach yourself to yield. Only God the Holy Ghost can teach you to yield. And because He looks into our heart and sees our heart and sees that hunger and sees the desire that these are all, oh Lord, you all that I desire, you all that I want. We go through the fire of God where every part of our life is adjusted and, and brought into divine order so that anything that would, that would be a wrong idea, wrong attitude, wrong belief, Law, wrong response. It's removed. So that our faith, our trust in Him, our relationship with Him be found in the praise and honor and glory in that day. I want everybody to stand with me, please. Jesus is calling you. Christ Jesus is calling you. He's calling you to come. You say, well, I came. I'm here. What are you talking about? He's calling you to come. He's calling you to come to a place that the most important thing to you right now is the kingdom of God. That there's nothing, there's nothing as important to you that really, and really it's all that is important to you. And that's really how Jesus said it, all that is important to you. It's really how Jesus said it. All that is important to you is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Somebody said, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. He said, don't make food important, don't seek after it. Don't make clothing important, don't go after it. Don't take any thought of your life, what you shall eat, what you shall wear. That's the basic essentials. Don't believe me, people. It, it keeps going on to all the rest of the stuff, too, that you're involved in. Your vacation, your, you know, your retirement plan, your career. It goes on and on. Just, Jesus dealt with just the fundamental aspects of that. When you're not taking care, thought of your food, you're not taking thought of your clothing, you're not be taking thought of the rest of it. It says, tells us. That it, in that realm, Having a desire for heaven. Having a desire to be with Him. Having a desire to just walk with Him in the spirit of the day. When He comes calling. Adam, where are you? Where are you? Adam, come, let's go. Let's do these things together. He knew, it, Adam, he knew where Adam was. He knew that Adam sinned. It's just a God's call out to us no matter where we're at. He's still... Once he still have a, has a plan for us, he still has a purpose for us. He created us in his image and his likeness to do the things that he's doing to do it with him. He's amazing. All you have to do is say, I want that. What you're doing, I want to do it with you. Paul says, If you then be risen with Christ, wow. That's the new life. It's totally, totally new life. And, I'm, and, I'm, and I don't mistake what I'm saying. I'm, when I talk about being born of God and receiving the divine nature that is unimpeachable. No more old nature there. It's unimpeachable. 
It is solid. It is absolutely settled forever what God did in the transformation in the miracle of the new birth. I'm talking more than anything else about the stuff that people allow back in because they don't set their affections on things above. They're not willing to recognize, hey, I've been raised up to a new life with Christ Jesus now to live back in the paradise, to live back in the heavenly realm. To live back in a oneness where nothing else matters. Think about the things that matters to you right now. Those are poison. Does it steal your joy? Poison. It's not of God. Does it take your peace? Poison. Not of God. Does it, inter did it, did it interfere with this divine love relationship? Poison. It's not of God. Say to the Lord, you alone have access to my desires because they're all my desires are in you. You alone, oh God, have access to my affections. For all my affections are in you. Above everything else, at the exclusion of all else, desire heaven. Desire the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Desire this realm of relationship that a great price was paid for you and I to be able to enter into this realm. You and I have received an anointing from God through the new birth so that we can step into the presence of God, live in oneness with Him. Hallelujah. Be taught every day by the living God. What a privilege. What a grace. What a grace. Just let the Lord touch you with His grace right now. There's no one should refuse the grace. You don't have to earn this. You just have to want this. How easy can that be? You don't have to be good enough for this. You just have to desire this with a true and sincere heart to know the living God. Oh, God. <sighs> Father, I pray right now that a revival of Holy Ghost conviction, a revival of truth that pierces the hearts of all men will begin right here in this building, right here among these people in this place. Lord, that has spread throughout the whole of this nation. God, that every church that is called by your name, that is here in this nation, that their hearts will be turned back to you, Lord, that they won't want all the stuff that they can have in this life and try to have you too. That they won't hold on to the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the pleasures of this world. They won't continue to interact with demon power through strife and criticism and debate. Oh, God, but every person's heart would be turned to you in love and affection. Oh, God, go after you and forget all things that would otherwise lead them astray. If you didn't be risen with Christ, set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth. And you could actually say it another way. If you are risen with Christ, then your affections won't have anything to do with these earthly things. Your affections, your trust, your desire, your wants. But your affections, your trust, your desire, your wants will all be above. In a realm called the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all in a realm called heaven. This is what Father says. This is what the Lord says. Somebody said, well, I, I just don't know how to even begin to do that. There's a grace for everybody who wants it. There is a divine provision for everybody who's needy enough. <laughs> oh, is it going to challenge you? Are you going to have to humble yourself along the way to have these things? Yeah, Father's going to see how much you want them because ultimately it's going to, it's going to 
come to crossroads in your life where you're going to have to be willing to respond in humility and brokenness to be able to walk on the right path, to walk the narrow way. You're going to have to say no to self and deny self again and again and again on a daily basis to walk on this narrow way. And the Lord sees it and He beholds it. And it's not works. It's a desire. It's your affections. It's not works. It's, a, it's a just saying yes to the grace that He's provided, to the opportunity that He's given. Because you can't walk the other way. You can't walk the broad way and have that which He's provided for us, access to live in this heavenly realm in a continual manifest presence of His glory. Because I'm telling you right now, you listen to me. When you walk in the manifest presence, you will not want sin anymore. <laughs> the new nature actually doesn't want sin. The divine nature doesn't want sin. And never was there supposed to be anything other than the divine nature, the new nature, continually being baptized, immersed, overwhelmed with the glory of the Holy Ghost, baptized in the presence of the manifest presence of Jesus. The people chose through false teaching, wrong thinking, other things that had been brought within their life, a compromise. And now to try to sort that out, well, all I got to do is just repent. Say, Lord, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to do what's right in your sight. I'm going to obey you. Set all my affections on things above. If you're risen with Christ, your affections will be on things above and you'll refuse other things. Not on things of this earth. For we are risen with Christ. We are dead with Him. And our life is hid in Christ. Hallelujah. Talk about the manifest presence. Talk about baptized in His glory. Talk about baptized in His glory. Talk about baptized in his, ooh, ha, serita. No, no. And that's what we have right now. But what takes place is that we choose other things. And when we choose other things that are not have any, that doesn't have anything to do with him, that are things of this world. When we choose, God gives us the right to choose. And we find ourselves now interacting with things that are not hid in him, that are not of him, that are not part of him. And that's where the compromise takes place. And all we got to do is just with a true and sincere heart say, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I don't want that. I just want you. And how long does that go on? For some people, it goes on a long time. The world, my own things, Jesus. Back and forth. And he's so loving. He's so gracious. So merciful. He comes with his manifest presence again and again and again. And he calls us unto himself. And he says, come unto me. And I'll give you rest. Come stay here. Come remain here. Come abide in me. Come live here. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Just let your hands towards heaven. Just receive all the love because he's not going to make you earn anything. You get to have it right now. All these things, all these good things in heaven are yours right now. Father, we thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for this love and this provision of the covenant that is in the blood of Jesus Christ that deals with every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, calling us all to come and live here in your presence, calling us all to come and put our whole trust and affections in you. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that every person in this place will respond to you this day, that they'll turn their back on sin and begin to walk with you, that they'll say no to the cares of this life and affections of this world and this earth, and say, Lord, all I desire is to do your will, O oh God. 
All I want is to live here in the fullness of your presence. All I want is to know you in all the realms of divine glory that you've made available to me. Now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I set you free from your past. Now in the name of the living God, I break every chain of darkness, every stronghold of the enemy. I open up the prison doors to you. I say in Jesus' name, step out and come in to this glorious liberty that's in Christ Jesus. It's only in Him. The Lord Jesus is here to bind up the broken in heart right now. He's here to change your affections. He's here to change your interest. I tell you, dear people, if you'll quit pursuing your own interest, <laughs> you'll first of all have everything that He's described that you can have in His Word. And then secondly, you'll have all the wealth of His blessings in every dimension. And it won't be gotten or obtained from your own hand, but given to you as a gift. Not by men, but by God Himself. He'll prosper you and cause you to step into an abundance of wealth. Everything about your life will be changed. If you just turn it over to Him now and follow Him. Turn all your life over to Him right now and follow Him. The strongholds of your life that have captivated your interest no longer in the name of Jesus. Renounce them. Renounce them right now. Right now, in Jesus' name, picture yourself in heaven. Picture yourself right now living in the kingdom of God. Picture yourself having stepped in to that eternal rest in Him and purpose in Him. Now leave everything else behind from this day forward that looks any different from what you're picturing at this moment. Because when you step into heaven and you step into Him, it's all over. The earth, is, the earth realm, the earth things are all over. Worldly things, worldly cares, it's over. It's over. It's over. Done. Over. And all you're doing is living for His pleasure, living for His interest. That's it. <laughs> now in Jesus' name. Now in Jesus' name. Now receive the grace to do it. Father's made the grace available. Let me tell you about the abiding place ministry. This place is going to have one of the greatest revivals that have ever taken place on the planet. It's going to happen right here. And what goes on here goes on in individuals' hearts because the wind is going to blow and it's going to drive the chaff away to get an individual ready. The fire is going to burn, so nothing but that which belongs to God is present. Also, that same thing happens in the context of the church. The wind blows, the wind of the Spirit blows. I mean, Joshua just wrote a, a, a powerful prophetic song we sang last night. And it's just right along these lines, we're going to sing it tonight. Because it's what God is doing. It's what He's doing by His Spirit in order to have a people who will not have different minds or different thinkings, but with what one mind and one purpose, that being the mind which Christ Jesus has and displayed by His lifestyle. It's not arbitrary. It's not this somebody's opinion. It's very clear for everyone to see and everyone to know and everyone to read so that Everybody can agree with God. This is what the Lord is doing with the wind blowing, the wind of His Spirit blowing to drive the different opinions away. This is what God is doing 
so that his fire would burn within us. So there would be no attachments of anything other than those interests which belongs to our Father which is in heaven. In the midst of that, Father always has a people then that are prepared unto every good work. That are ready to be used by Him. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, mama se ki pranana ni. Ah, mrde mene kanda la baya. Aros te pa urane. Evriba no se ki la yetu. I want to pray for everybody here today whose heart's not right with God. If your heart's not right with God. I'll pray for you. If, if your affections are not in heaven, your heart's not right with God. If all your affections are not in heaven, your heart's not right with God. If the things of the kingdom of God and His righteousness is not all that is important to you, your heart's not right with God. If hungering and thirsting after righteousness is not where your heart is at, your heart's not right with God. If the cares of this life Deceitfulness of riches and pleasures of this world has any part in your life, your heart's not right with God. God, the Holy Spirit is here to shine the floodlight of heaven upon each person's soul so each man can know whether or not his heart is right with God. If your heart's not right with God today, Father, in His loving kindness and His mercy, will make a way so your heart can be right with God. See, there is no condemnation, is there? It's rather a call. Condemnation would be if your heart would sort you out and prove to you that your heart's not right with God and then would leave you there. That would be condemnation. That would be rejection. But God in His mercy and His grace allows the call to go forth and the invitation to come and then points out the things that would keep you from being able to respond and receive. But it rests with you. It rests with you. It rests with you. The decision rests with each one of you. God is calling people in this room today, right now. You cannot afford a day of your heart not being right with God. And then we entrust ourselves to the Holy Spirit to keep our hearts right with God every day. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's the power of God on you. That's the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Isn't it wonderful to be able to feel the presence, the manifest presence of Jesus? He's so full of love. And let me just tell you this. Let me tell you. We begin to feel the manifest presence of Jesus. We want to make sure that that results in our pursuing Him. Because it's a terrible thing to have the manifest presence of God and not afterwards hunger for more. Just keep pursuing now because it keeps getting better. Don't let up. The Lord's not teasing you. He's just creating hunger in you, drawing you, showing you how to yield. So you can have these things all the time. If your heart's not right with God, I want you to come right now and pray for you. Just come.
your heart's not right with God, come. Wow. Love his presence. If your heart's not right with God, come. For he is here to make your heart right. He's here to work a miracle. If your heart's not right with God, come. Father, we recognize that it's only by your, the miracle of your grace that all the other interests of this life and all the other affections and all the other things that have become so meaningful and so valuable to us can be removed and displaced by just wanting to to know you and walk with you and live in you and live with you and experience your manifest presence all day long. Now, Father, I ask you in Jesus' name that every person that stands up here right now, that from this day forward, a change will come and they will begin to respond to you, to your call and come and abide for the rest of their life in your presence. Hallelujah. And if for a moment they don't feel your manifest presence, they'll be crying out, Oh God, oh God, oh God. Come feel me now. They won't be willing to go all day long without a manifest presence because their heart's so hungry, so thirsty for you. Hallelujah. And I say that not only to those who are standing here, but to every one of you out there. Every one of you watching on the web and watching this by way of YouTube. All you've got to do is be willing to demand the presence of God for He demands it for you. He's calling out as much as He called out to Adam saying, Adam, come on, where are you at? Showing His heart's interest to fulfill His plan for you no matter what it is you've done. Christ Jesus has made a way all the way back in to the fullness of His presence, the fullness of relationship. There's no reason for you to stay outside. Don't run the risk of being exiled. Don't be, run the risk of being cast out of His presence forever. At any moment in time that you feel like that there's something wrong in your life, don't wait for the prophet to come and speak and say, you're the man. Cry out instead and say, Oh God, take not your presence from me. Let His presence be more important to you and how much money you have in the bank account, or whether or not you have friends, let His presence become more important to you than anything. And you'll discover that there's far more to what's available right now than you ever imagined. You discover more God than you ever believed in. You discover more Jesus than you've ever thought possible. You discover more power of the Holy Ghost than you could have ever imagined. God's looking at your heart. Not just one day a week. Not for just a couple of hours. But every day. Father numbers the people. He knows where you're at. When Elijah was uncertain about where all Israel stood, God said, I see 7,000 who've not bowed their knee. He counted every one. There are 7,000 still reserved unto me that did not bow the knee to ball to the things of this world. God's mindful of what everybody chose. He knows. Today you're going to choose. Come on in now. I want you to imagine. I want you to be able to see it. You step it into heaven. And you're going to live there now. You're stepping into Jesus. And you're only going to live for God's divine purpose and will. You're stepping past religion. You're stepping past your ideas. You're stepping past those things that are convenient to you. 
into the manifest presence of the Lord. I'm going to pray over every person that's standing up here right now. And I'm telling you right now, I want you to understand. God's choice is clear. What he's chosen is undeniable. He's chosen to fill you up with all of his fullness and bless you with all of his blessings. Now you choose that that's all you want. And that's what you're choosing. And God's going to give you the divine grace right now. God himself giving you divine grace right now. To not be distracted anymore. Put him first. Surrender everything you got to Father. Put it all on an altar. Everything that's been holding you back. Everything that's been disappointing you. Everything that's been causing you fear and confusion. Put it on an altar right now. Let's have a fire. Let's have a fire coming from heaven. Let's have a fire from God. Let's have an offering that's been made acceptable unto the Lord. Let's have a witness now that everything has changed. You're not going to go back to that stuff because all you're going to find is ashes anyways. You can't reconstruct it. Hallelujah. Now, in Jesus' name. Now, in Jesus' name. No more cancer, no more fungus. No more cancer, no more fungus, in Jesus' name. Now, in Jesus' name. Now in Jesus' name, just receive. Hallelujah. <laughs> just receive. And Father, make it real to you by His grace. You'll see the ship is sinking. It's on fire. It's, sure, it's certain destruction to stay. Abandon, forsaking. All other things. Hallelujah. Ha, ha, ha. Hallelujah. Abandoned ship! Forsaking all other things! Take up your cross now. Take up your cross now. Take up your cross now. Take up your cross to call of God upon your life to lay your life down. Take up your cross and follow me. That is the key to revival, filling the land, to the lost coming to know the Son of Man, to the broken heart being healed and the hard heart being transformed and made like flesh. Just a few is all it takes. Maybe only 11 or 12 120 will do turn the up world upside down Lord Jesus Christ for you totally abandoning all other things taking up our cross in Jesus name oh God Lord Jesus to follow you to live only to do the will of the Father Say no, not for me. Say no, not for me. No, not for me. No exile for me. Listen, dear people, I'm going to say this one more time to you, then I'm going to close. You're going to have to sacrifice something. You're either going to sacrifice the pleasures of heaven for temporal pleasures now. Or you're going to sacrifice temporal pleasures now for the pleasures of heaven. You're going to have to sacrifice something. What are you going to sacrifice? You're either going to sacrifice those things which can never last. Those things that will only bring destruction. Though it looks like it's something you've got to have. So that you might have that which lasts forever. Which brings all that would satisfy going to have to sacrifice something. What will you sacrifice? Will you sacrifice heaven for earth? Will you sacrifice these pleasures that are in His presence for the pleasures that are temporal for which only man can bring? Which only demon powers would induce? Or will you sacrifice 
these temporal pleasures now to have the joys of his life now heaven now heaven now heaven now. manifest presence now living in the glory now see the reason I have the manifest presence in my life all the time is because I demand it that's all because God's already demanded he's already demanded now he gave me a will and said will you demand it of yourself will you demand it of me will you demand it will you demand it will you command your life and order your conduct before those things which I have ordered? Will you conform in every way to that which I have purposed for you? For this is where heaven is. It's right here in this realm. You get to choose. You want this realm? That's the realm of Jesus. Then come on in. You get to choose. You want this realm? Then all the other things have to stay away. All the other attitudes, all the other way. So my soul says, ah, I take heaven. Your manifest presence at any price, at any cost. Therefore, things that are unholy won't come out of my mouth. Hallelujah. <laughs> Deeds and actions that are contrary to his ways. I'm not having those. Manifest presence is far better to me than anything else. I'm not interested in just a touch. A touch brought me to this place. I didn't just let a touch be a touch. I let a touch be a call from Jesus Christ to me. And I said, yes, Lord. And so are you. Amen. Yeah, and so are you. That's it. And I'll sing and you're going to stuck and I, and you're going to stay right there. Hello, Mom, Jake, and Lang and die. Yes, ma'am. Yep, 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 yep. And Papa's going to give you all the desires of your heart, and you don't need to be disappointed ever again because all your affections are in Him. That's this is the way it is. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Brakada. Hallelujah. 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 Kadia da 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 Thank you, Jesus. Ha 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 this divine ability. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. Listen, God's got a great big gigantic plan that He's purposed in, for you to walk in. And things are just getting started. They not half over. They just getting started. They just getting started. You know, the grace of the Lord, the Lord had given David ability, you know, in business. And his heart was really concerned with it. And then one day he said, I don't want business anymore. I want to live for the purposes of the kingdom. I want to find myself in the middle of service to the king. Yeah. You know what that fundamentally means? Functioning in the anointing of his manifest presence. Sit. That's what it means. There's, no, there's nothing that you can substitute for that. That's why the Lord poured out His Spirit upon all flesh. And as soon as the glory came, baptized in the very person of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 What, listen, we want, you to, we want you to come back tonight. We want you to come back tonight. Don't just come to one meeting. It just proved that your heart's not right. So they said, well, you're putting a lot of pressure on me. I got to go to work in the morning. No pressure. No pressure. We just want you, we want you to, we want you to have an encounter with God to where that you desire continually to be in the midst of that which he is doing and preparing to do. God's not going to be preparing to do anything in your living room tonight. <laughs> what he is, is he's preparing in the midst of his church. He's organizing and arranging. He's placed everything that belongs to the giftings and to the power and the glory 
of Christ Jesus in the midst of the church. He has. Hallelujah. 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 And so we just want you to come back tonight. We want you to receive strength, divine ability, direction, empowerment, encouragement. Hallelujah. Right, right out of the realms of that which God himself is ministering. We want you to enter his... We want you to enter his gates with thanksgiving. We want you to come into his presence with singing. That's how I come into his presence and I just stay there. Amen. Hallelujah. In his presence, the hills melt like wax. In his presence, the, earth, the whole earth trembles. That's the power of his presence. At the moving of his presence, life comes forth. Thank you, Jesus. Faith realm, faith realm, faith realm that begins to happen through your life because you delight yourself in the Lord. When you delight yourself in the Lord, faith realm begins to work in your life. And whatever you ask, He does it. That's why when you delight yourself in the Lord, He gives you the desires of your heart. Because that's delighting yourself in the Lord is a relationship place that faith is developed. Father, you hear you whisper. Say, Lord, I want, to do, I want that and I want that for your kingdom. So I said, Lord, I want this property right here and I want it for your kingdom. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the God on Saturday. Huh? Thank you, Jesus. We're going to be moving over next door right away. We're going to need a whole bunch of help on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to get the job done. And if you can come before then, come help. Lots of work to do. Good. We're going to move. We move in over there. We're not going to be half here and half there. We're going to move over there. Thank you, Jesus. Monday, pra, si pratai, pura baba datai, pura satara la bate, pura satara la dekete, mandose iklaste. Malankinda. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hallelujah. Uh huh. Ah. Uh, yep. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Ha ha ha. Blande Rusha Galamande Hisht. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> 